I congratulate faculty of agriculture, staff, students, as well as SAHAS for organizing this conference. The theme for this conference is Sustainable Agriculture and Technology and Importance of Health and Environment. It's very rightly chosen. I think this is the demand of the day to think over what is to be done in the agriculture sector which is beneficial for human as well as no disturbance to the environment. Friends, why do we study science? We all are from science team. But have we ever thought of this? Why do we study science? Yes, the purpose is twofold. To increase the longevity of human being and to make the life more comfortable. is revolving around these two points. That how we can make human to be immortal and how the human can be comforted. Similarly, agriculture farming is equally important for the survival of According to the World Bank report, we have 7.7 billion population globally, which may increase to 9 billion in the next 25 years. And to feed the, those people, we need to have 70% more food products. Food yield, agriculture product yield, and we have the limited resources. The land is the same, and even the land area is reducing because of so many factors urbanization, human intervention, this and that. With the result, we have to manage with this small land which is cultivable and which can feed the human population of 9 billion people so that no mouth goes to sleep without food. Point is, what are our resources? What we do today? Are the agriculture techniques, the farming techniques, sustainable in future also. This is, and I, I congratulate the organizers to think of this, what will be the future, how to use the technology for reset in the morning, that the green revolution revolutionized food production in India. So, because I remember the days when our second Prime Minister, Sri Lal Bahadur Shastri Ji, he went to United States that kindly help us because we just had the war in Pakistan and he appealed to the US government to help us by just reporting some kind of meat or other things. And 
the United States refused to help because that was a political decision. When Prime Minister came back, he vowed to the country, and I tell you, the country also supported that we will miss every Monday in the evening. We will miss the dinner. The whole country did not get for some time in 1966-67. I still remember those days. After that came the Green Revolution, the White Revolution, the Blue Revolution, and we got. Now, the government is proud to say that we have so much stock of food grain in the RCX stores and all that. That's true. But how we came to this? What do we call those the demons of the environment, the demons of biodiversity, the demons of health, the pesticides, the insecticides, the herbicides, the fertilizers. Maximum use of fertilizers, the use of pesticides. Certainly, the crop yield is increased, but at the same time, it is affecting the health also. You must have seen Passer domesticus, the common sparrow. Its population was shrinking, dwindling. The vultures, hardly vultures were seen. Their decline in population was the result of the spray of pesticides and indirectly affecting the human health also. Technology certainly improved the heat, the productivity, the commercialization of agriculture, but at the same time, it has affected the environment. 30% of population, uh, the 40% the of pollution is because of the transportation of food material, the agricultural material. The degradation of water resources, the pollution of water, air and land due to the excessive use of pesticides and herbicides, fertilizers is another point. The challenge now is we all know that we are getting food grains and all that. But at the same time, the excessive use is affecting the human health also. The human environment also. And this is an inversal factor. That if you will disturb the environment, if you will disturb the ecology, certainly it is going to disturb the world. Newton's third law. For that, it's a challenge to the scientists that what are the innovations, what are the new techniques which will certainly help the agriculture sector to give more yield, higher productivity higher income to the farmers, higher income to the society, and at the same time, not losing the health and the environment. And I am sure this kind of conference, the deliberations in the conference, will give us some new ideas, so that 
coming generations, the young fellows sitting here, when you opt for research, certainly look into that, that how we can make farming more sustainable, sustainable agriculture and applying the new technology, the new techniques without any genetic manipulation of the human population. Because genetic manipulation in crops is okay. But how that is going to affect your health, your progeny, coming generations, that is to be seen. I'm sure learned scientists present here certainly throw some idea, throw some light on these issues. My sincere thanks goes out to Dr. H.S. Banyal for his words of wisdom and sharing insights on the scenario of agriculture so as to make it sustainable one. Moving forward, we now have, uh, we now have awards to Dr. Lalita Reddy and Ms. Veena Sharma. To do the honours, may I now call upon President of SAHAS, Dr. Rajan Kamboj and the Dean, D.R. Thakur sir, to do the honours. Thank you. May I now call upon Ms. Suvina Sharma to receive the honours. Thank you, Dr. Rajan and Dr. Dia Thakur for doing the honours. Moving on, may I now call upon Dr. H.C. Sharma, ex-Vice Chancellor, Dr. Vyas Parmar University of Horticulture and Forestry, Nauni Solan Himachal Pradesh for their brief presentation. Over to you, sir. A very good afternoon to all of you. Save a loud one. Good afternoon. Yeah, now it seems you are awake. Um, so, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Avilasi University, Dr. H. S. Panial, Dean College of Agriculture, and my collegiate, Dr. D. R. Thakur, Dr. Rajan Kambhaus, uh, the president organizers of this conference, fellow delegates, the faculty and students of Abilasi University, a good afternoon to all of you. I am very happy to share that dais today and thank you Abilasi University and Dr. Thakur and Rajan for giving this opportunity to me. I had seen this campus from a distance while going to Th Thunag to establish the campus of University of Horticulture and Forestry there, which also serve, will serve you and, and the farming community. But I am very happy to be here today. There are a few things when, when we talk of agriculture, food and food security. You have heard enough ample information on this topic from the speakers, 
in the morning and now professor banyal has highlighted the importance of food that we must we our job is to ensure that nobody sleeps without a food or nobody sleeps with an empty stomach and then that's of course the res responsibility of the agriculture students and scientists to ensure that we develop technologies the systems and the varieties that can give us the maximum productivity with the minimum inputs or the inputs that we have at hand so that we can produce more per drop of water per unit of time and per unit of area a few points for the university and, and the budding or young generation or the young scientist for us to deliver that foods and nutritional security we must produce we must have the good educational system and to provide that good education to the students we need meritorious and quality teachers and scientists professor banyal that's what i was referring to that you must listen to my talk that we must have quality teachers and scientists and a quality infrastructure so that we can empower our young scientists or the new generation with the all basics of the science that we need to have to be able to plan our research and research delivery in such a way that our research outputs do not fail when it goes to the farmers field another thing we need for quality education and research is a quality infrastructure and what i see in the private enterprises and also in avilas university is a very good infrastructure so congratulations to the management of avilas university the honorable vice chancellor and the faculty you have a very good neat and clean environment as compared to what we see in the, in the government institutions or in the universities now having studied here that will inculcate you the habit of a good laboratory practice a good environment a clean environment that we don't spoil our environment that is the first intervention that we ensure that we live in a healthy environment and and we don't spoil it another thing is then comes the responsibility of the scientists and the young generations that whatever we do we must plan our research on robust principles of science there is no shortcut otherwise it cuts short people can make tall claims people can give any kind of a what you call a shortcut formula for you to do great things but if that doesn't stand the test of the time then we fail as a community and one of our job is to ensure that everything is that is done by us and, and around us is based on principles of equity quality and good laboratory practice and of course when we do that science we must communicate that science we, whatever we invest in our research whatever research we do we do, do in a robust manner so that we we publish it we communicate it to the people either through a research article through the news newspapers or the newsletter articles so that the other people do not invest the same amount of time and money to repeat that science or the research that we do and then it must be published in a good impact factor research journals we in india probably produce the most number of research papers and they continue so i was on the publication that whatever we do we must write good papers and those must be published in journals that have an impact factor function due to impact factor of more than one and what in agriculture the cost is in us rating of more than six and then our research whatever we publish in papers that must lead to a technology that can be adopted by either by the industry or by the farmers or leads to development of the paper now the for the universities to have their standing in the committee of universities whether nationally or internationally that ranking is based on the employability of the students placement what proportion of the students get the jobs in in your campus uh, recruitment how many papers the faculty 
and students published in, in which journals and what is the ranking and citation, how many patents that you find and how many of those patents are then purchased by the industry and used by the industry. That determines our standing among the NIRF rating, this national institution ranking framework and rating or in the NAS, uh, sorry, this ICR uh, rating for the agricultural universities and pathology. So, these are a few points I think that are in your interest for us to be able to counter among the educational institutions or universities in the country and world over. So, now moving on to I thought instead of just skipping, giving some remarks, I share some of my thoughts about how we can sustain agriculture and then what's important us is to produce, have a sustainable increase in productivity because we have to feed the ever increasing population. So, this is, this is the challenge before us. So, now we can have the lights off so that anybody who likes to have a nap is free to do so. So, can we have this light on? And where I can change us. As we see from this uh, slide, we have a we have a geometric increase in human population. It is increasing at an alarming rate. If we look at the total food production, then we had a geometric increase in the total food production from 1850 to around 1950. But after that, we only have a marginal increase in the total food availability in the world, and that is the situation today. And what? So what we can do? Of course, one area for us is to reduce the pest associated losses because I am an entomologist. So what what you see from there is insect pests on an on an average cause about 30 percent loss and at times they can cause more than 80 percent loss in cost. So if you just do an effective pest management we can save energy for the human population. So how we have increased this total food productivity or food production over the last four or five decades that we have used the high yielding varieties and high weight for most of the crops. In the last uh, 30 or 40 years, then we have had greater use of our irrigation potential, fertilizers, and pesticides. Then we went for mechanization 50, 25 to 50 years back. We used to plow the fields with a bullock drawn plow or with a horse drawn plow, but today there are no option for both in the village side. We all use only mechanization of the tractor. Then, of course, one of the latest tools with us is to increase productivity or reduce the pest associated losses, the use of genetic engineering and biotechnology and that of course is a new kind of a tool in our hand in, in future. What you see, we talked about the green revolution in the morning, so as a result of green revolution, we, we had this increase in production of rice and wheat, the blue blue and the black uh, lines in the top. Uh, right from around 951, we had around 20 million uh, production. Today we have over 120 million tons of production of both this uh, rice and wheat, even though our oil seed and pulses production has only seen a marginal increase. But what has also happened is that the productivity per hectare that has also almost uh, Double uh, uh, that has also increased in India, but when we see the productivity in India, our productivity of say paddy or wheat is only half of what we have in the United States, and this is also true for other cereals. Whereas in pulses, uh, we are much closer. So, if we close this productivity gap between what we harvest in India and what they harvest in America, so we will still have a scope to double our total production or availability of uh, food crops in India. And uh, but 
as a result of uh, increased use of these high yielding varieties, the fertilizers, the water, and, uh, and of course, uh, the pesticide, it has, uh, it can display the pesticides that's what we saw in the morning. It kills many of the natural enemies and this gives rise to occurrence of new pests and development of resistance insecticides. That's what most people talk about. It also affects the natural enemies in the ecosystem. So that's what uh, Professor Banyal was also alluding to and the health hazards to the person who sprays it and the environmental contamination of water and the food and food products and that's a major challenge to us. But this is a bit disturbing. When we look at the fertilizer and the pesticide consumption in India, the fertilizer consumption in India is less than half of what we have in the United States. And when we talk of pesticide, that as a result of pesticide use, there are a lot of ill effects, the water contamination, the development of resistance, the non-target effects on birds and other beneficial organisms. But in India, we only consume about half a kilogram of pesticides. That, that, that's a combination of insecticides, herbicides, and the fungicides compared to two kilograms, <laughs> nearly the same thing kilograms in Taiwan or 13 kilograms in China. So our pesticide or the fertilizer consumption is not alarming at all. What, what is unfortunate is that it is their misuse in certain pockets on certain crops that is giving rise to the ill effects or harmful effects of pesticides. Mostly pesticide is residues on vegetables and fruit. Excessive fertilizer used in rice and wheat or, or in sugarcane. So, if we go for a rational use of anything, whether it is salt, it is sugar, it is fertilizer, or it is pesticide, we go with the prescribed, prescribed dose, we follow the procedure, then that is intended to have only a beneficial effect, no ill effects at all. But if we misuse anything, for example, we need Overuse of salt, overuse of sugar. For example, people of my age who are 65 plus, so we cannot metabolize that much amount of sugar converted into calories, energy, or put, put in use uh, as an output in our work environment. So, this is uh, one of the things we have to keep in mind wherever people talk that it is pesticides and fertilizers which are spoiled and environment. No. It is the misuse, overuse of pesticides and fertilizers that has resulted in ill effects in certain pockets of certain environments. So that we do not develop, um, we, we don't become psychic about certain things without they actually being so. I, I hope you got, got, got this point. And uh, this is uh, one analysis I did about uh, what we can do to increase productivity that uh, in wheat uh, or rice or in many of the crops we have now hybrids and varieties where can we harvest from about 7 to 10 tons per hectare, right? The average productivity on the farmer's fields is only about one and a half, one and a half tons or two tons. But if we can aim to harvest Half of the productive potential of the high yielding varieties and hybrids that has say five tons per hectare, that itself is enough to ensure us a food and nutritional security and feed us for the next 25 years. And that's what our aim is to be able to harvest on an average five to seven tons per hectare of wheat and rice, and of course, two and a half to three or four tons of pulses and oil seed. And for us to, for Himachal Pradesh, what we can do is to increase productivity. And of course, at that time, there were much talked about uh, world doubling farmers' income. I really didn't understand how we can double it in over three years. But we had a committee formed for each state and for Himachal. I, I chaired those meetings, and Dr. Pankas, who is sitting here, he also contributed the data. 
for that how we can do that so the inputs of the agriculture scientists all over himachal pradesh department of agriculture and horticulture that information we synthesize in the form of strategies for doubling farmers in himachal pradesh this document is available on the uhf uh, website you can all access it and see what components of it you can really focus on or you can look at so that they can use those strategies and information to increase that uh, farm productivity then of course we have the climate change and we are seeing it when i was studying in seoul in 1970s 70s we used to have snowfall three or four times a year and uh, in 2016 when i came back to seoul and after four decades i left it in 1976 came in 2016 then it the snowfall occurred after nine years so those are the kind of the climate variability the global warming and the climate change that we are experiencing so now we have to develop technology of course um, that can withstand the effects of climate change and this one example i have picked up from maize if we develop maize varieties that are tolerant to drought and heat stress even if there is a rise in temperature from 1 to 5 degrees celsius they will only suffer about 20% loss in productivity but if our varieties are susceptible to drought and temperature stress or heat stress what will happen is with a 5 degree increase in uh, temperature they will suffer more than 40% loss in productivity therefore all our research in future has to be geared to identi- identify and develop varieties that can withstand biotic stress biotic means insects and pathogens or diseases and abiotic stress the abiotic stress is the drought stress it can be moisture stress also but it has to be heat stress also ability of the crops to set seed or have pollination process going on so that they can set proper seed and that seed can develop into a grain which we can harvest so this is one example other effects of the climate change that will occur and for you to fo- focus both in probably agricultural or basic sciences is altered profile of pollinators and scavengers some of the insect pollinators or bird pollinators that are active today some of those might become extinct or disappear in the future another is the changes in the composition of pollinators for example in our childhood we had seen lot of bumblebees in our front yards pollinating many of the cucurbits uh, uh, around the homestead usko hum log bhund bolte the yadi main aaj bolu ke bhai kisne bhund dekha bolenge nahi ye kya hua because because of the climate change and the change in our agriculture practices some of those uh, insects are now seen becoming rare and rare or are about to become extinct and we have to be aware of this thing then asynchrony a disconnect between the flowering time of the trees and the emergence time of the insect or the bird pollinators because of the climate change so all these things have to be studied then that should form an important component of the research in future and of course the landscape change due to change in pollinators and आप पुराने जमाने में देखे कहीं भी और मैं हिंदी में आ गया ओके यूज टू हैव मेज इन द मेज बी यूज टू हैव उर्द बीन बी यूज टू हैव कुल्थी द मूंग बीन द राजमा नाउ बी गो टू द फार्मर्स फील्ड दे ओनली हैव इधर मेज और द बीट बिकॉज इट इज द ट्रैक्टर वाला हु प्लॉज द फील्ड देन यू ब्रॉडकास्ट द सीड एंड यू ओनली गो फॉर हार्वेस्ट those so those agricultural practices have changed they have gone a sea change be talk of diversity but there will be less and less diversity in agricultural food production because less and less people are there who are ready to go to the farm and then of course cult have those mixed cropping intercropping 
that added to the diversity we are going more or more to the monocropping so we have to have a proper ecosystem of the water seed planning so that we maintain that diversity at different levels or in different types of the ecological niches or locations that we have some are damp some are dry some are ridges some are uh, rivulets so each of those we can probably try to maintain that uh, diversity another point for you and of course as a result of climate change another thing that's happening is the concentration of carbon dioxide is increasing it was around 250 ppm about 50 years back today it is around 300 ppm of co2 and in next 15 years 20 years it is going to be 550 ppm and if we increase the co2 concentration to 550 ppm what happens is you see this chickpea here this this is devoured by a pest called spodoptera exigua which was not recorded as a pest of chickpea till now of course this is our own research from andhra pradesh this is a pigeon pea plant the tuwar dal <coughs> if we grow these plants under the 550 po2 over within about 24 48 hours this plant is dead because of the feeding of this uh, uh, mealy bugs which has not been a serious pest today similarly white flies on a chickpea plant at 550 white flies were never recorded on chickpea for the last 100 years but and high temperatures and high co2 i don't know how white fly decided that they can still feed on chickpea so some of these are some of the changes that will occur as a result of coming the organisms the pests or the pathogens that were never recorded to feed on a particular crop we will see them as serious pest and some of the serious pests which were there they are becoming no less and less important i i worked for four decades 37 years on a pest called helicoverpa armejara cotton wool worm or pot borer and we said it's written that 55% of the total pesticides produced in the world is used to control helicoverpa i also ended up having a conference like this have written a book is there but i see nobody talks about helicoverpa anymore i feel very sad but it's good that it no more is as much a serious pest of crops as it was 25 years back of course the major contribution has come from the transgenic bt cotton a point which i will elaborate uh, later and of course what we can do now is the new technologies to double or increase farmers income or increase productivity is to have efficient use of water develop quality seeds adopt high or ultra high density plantings of the our fruit trees mechanization protected cultivation and of course greater application of biotech nanotech and information tech and of course value addition and marketing this is about water conservation we convert conserved it in ponds and dams or we develop the ponds where water simply seeps into the different layers of the soil profile and that is how it will go on feeding the eco system or you have drip irrigation or poly thin mulching to conserve water that will save 30% water and that's what i said developing pest resistant variety is the key to sustainable crop production why we are able to have enough food today wheat is available all over the country and we are even able to export because the scientists developed the wheat rust resistant this is wheat rust if you have a plant is affected by wheat rust it doesn't set a panicle and doesn't have the grain but india is the best equipped and most successful in developing high yielding varieties of wheat that are resistant to different wheat rust and we are continuously winning this battle so that there is no crop loss another is developing pest resistant varieties some examples from my own work in ekri said this is a pigeon pea variety tolerant to helicoverpa released in uh, telangana this is a sorghum variety resistant to a sorghum is this is released in karnataka ma'am this is your home state uh, <clears throat> and this is was cultivated 
And you know, interesting is sorghum is a small insect. This is a red, red-bodied insect. You cannot see it with the naked eye. It only comes out early in the morning, about 7:30 a.m. Lays about uh, 100-150 eggs by about 11 a.m. and then it dies. Nobody says that what damage the crop. They don't know. The breeders will say it is uh, sterility or pollen shattering or whatever. But I told them it is none of these. It is sorghum mint. So what I am highlighting is the need for us to go to the field every day, examine your crop and the environment very carefully, and see which organism does what, when, how, and then what we can do if they are harmful to control the damage caused by them. And uh, Professor Banyal, this is the point I was highlighting. the introduction of bt transgenic cotton where the cotton plant itself produces a toxin protein which otherwise is produced by the bacterium bacillus thuringiensis you took a gene from bacillus bacillus thuringiensis inserted into the cotton plant and that provided the plant the ability to resist the pest attack and what happens is if you have a bt hybrid that is that is what the farmers will see your harvest the same hybrid without the bt gene you don't have even 10% of the expected yield what you have here now as a result of the release of the bt cotton in india there is a four times increase in cotton production so four times increase in cotton yard the hosiery products and the cloth production and we not only export the seed cotton or cotton lint but or yarn but we also export the clothing so that also gives gives a benefit to our industry and similar in <coughs> and there is a four times reduction in pesticide so application of biotechnology in a rational manner is a new tool in our hand so to maximize the input use efficiency in in future and similar increase in productivity can be realized in other crops by using the modern technique for you to know more about it read biotechnological approaches for pest management and ecological sustainability and many people ask questions and lot of information is put in the public media which is not science based say the transgenic crops will destroy the biodiversity they are harmful to the human beings this and that but it is not and that information is uh, there in environment safety of biotech and conventional ipn technologies these are compared well you can access these books uh, someone want a information or a particular topic you can probably reach me or we can use now the molecular marker assisted breeding to first is to identify the chromosomal regions that contribute to insect resistance and then of course use these markers to see the movement of those genes into the future into the progeny we can also go for gene editing modification the gene gene function and by modifying the coloring for example gene we can have tomatoes that are red that are yellow or that are green or of various shades shapes and sizes this was called crispr cas9 gene editing technology we must make ourselves conversant with this one and of course use these techniques in uh, developing the final products and uh, another another example for example if you use a early flowering gene in plum if you put a up early flowering gene in the plum tree or plum seedling what we can do is we can convert that plum uh, from a tree to a vine and those plants can be even grown in the greenhouse and by putting that earliness they will bear fruits in about 2 years they then we can grow, grow them under high density or under greenhouses or we put a gene stoneless plum then the normal stone stoned fruit and then we can also have plums that are without a Uh, that are without a stone so with the bio with the gene editing and biotechnological applications 
we can make any changes that are desirable for us and of course we can use to maximize productivity, yield or taste. And this is a golden rice, another intervention. Most people are deficient in vitamin A that leads to line, night blindness, but there is a golden rice produced, that gene can be expressed in any of the crops. So if you can have that uh, beta carotene from any of the crops that we eat, uh, we can decrease and or eliminate our need to access vitamin A in any other capsule form. So this uh, slide I put for the humorous sake. Uh, the misinformation about biotechnology is such that even a cock got confused. He asked the hen, how come, how come you laid an egg that gave rise to elephant? So Murgi bole tu ne pichle saal mujhe transgenic chickpi khilai thi. Isi liye ho ande se haathi nikalaya. Aisa kabhi nahi hota hai. We know the gene and we know the gene function. That is precise and that is the information how we should interact with the general public to tell them biotechnology is safe. And of course this is a slide about uh, high density planting of the fruit trees where we can increase the productivity four times. And uh, this is about protected cultivation. You know more about it. Lot of poly houses in this region. That is you have hydroponics. And then of course you can, if you have no land, you can go for mushroom cultivation. You can go for honey base. Another important intervention that we have not made use of. 80% of the vegetables and fruit, 80% is water. So if we simply develop a process to chop and dry fruits and vegetables in a sun dryer, we can reduce the volume and weight by four times. That can reduce the transportation cost. That can also reduce the on-farm and the market losses. The dried fruits and vegetables, we can packet them. Fruits and vegetables normally have a perishable life of one week. Once we dry and packet them, we can increase the shelf life to one year. So this is another area we have to focus, popularize, practice and put to use. That is the only way then farmer's income can be increased. Now there is also a lot of noise about the natural farming, the organic farming. So the few basic points for your concern. Professor Banyal talked about Newton's third law. And I would like to talk about Einstein's first law. That is E is equal to mc square. Who will tell me what is E is equal to mc square? Students? E is equal to mc square. Energy produced is equal to mass multiplied by velocity of light squared. The meaning of this equation is the matter can neither be created nor destroyed. If you destroy the matter, then you explode an atom bomb and you produce energy that destroys everything. So when we come to natural farming or organic farming, the field will produce only as much crop as the nutrients and water we apply in the field. If we do not have those nutrients, please gossip. Students, huh? Oh, yeah, huh? Good. If we do not apply enough nutrients and water in the soil, there is no way the farmer can harvest optimum crop yield. We have to have input and once we harvest the crop, whatever the nutrients the crop takes out of the soil, we have to replenish those nutrients again in the soil to take that crop. So I have done a simple calculation here. For us to be able to harvest five tons of, say, rice or wheat per hectare, 
the crop needs around 175 kg nitrogen this farm yard manure gobar that can only give you around 55 kg of nitrogen around i'm not sure this figure must be wrong or 15 kg of p2o5 and about <coughs> 20 or 20 25 kg of potassium and if you want to go to the natural farming as per the formula prescribed by its proponents where you apply 750 liters of jeev amrit four times during the crop season that will be 3000 liters of water in hills i don't know how we can get 4000 3000 liters of water when we don't have enough water for drinking in our homes and that jeev amrit or ghan amrit will give you around uh, 250 grams of nitrogen maybe 0.001 grams of p2o and same is around uh, potassium so if these practice of organic and natural farming do not have the enough amount of nutrients to support an optimum plant growth for the farmer to realize a average yield of 5 tons per hectare then i don't know ye padhatiyan kaise kisan ko ameer bana sakti hain main to nahi samajh paya hu aaj tak aap main koi samajhta ho to please you are welcome for a discussion but probably for me it's not as a result of this the total area under organic farming all over the world is about 5 million hectares and is about uh, less than 1 and a half million hectares in asia out of the total cultivated area for maybe 5000 million hectares if asia or whatever it is dr pankaj maybe you can do the right calculations what is the total arable land area that is cropped in these regions now coming to the natural versus the chemical it is not either or or we have to have a right blend a combination of both the organic inputs and the synthetic inputs for example if i have a headache i can have a oil massage i can put some balm but um, after about half an hour i feel i cannot tolerate it so i take paracetamol similarly the farmer whose living is dependent on that two and a half acres or whatever land he is if he applies any of these organic inputs or even bio pesticides which have a latent working effective period of about 15 days by the time they have a action either most of the organic inputs only have 60% of the biological effectiveness of what we can achieve with the synthetic chemical this is given for the farmer to wait for the action of these natural things can he have afford to lose his entire crop instead of harvesting say five tons is the farmer ready to harvest only one or a half a ton and can he support that family his family with that half a ton because he has to buy the inputs the books the medicines the clothing from the same shops and the same sources that we do if we want good clothing we want good uh, good products to use ourselves we want to educate our children in good schools so does the farmers therefore we should only recommend to the farmers what is practical for him what is economic for him not force people to do something that is based on beliefs not supported by science i think i should leave my comments here so of course technology is the alley we must use now precision farming the information technology detection of pests and diseases or use it to design and or uh, plan our interventions for uh, effective crop production to summarize what we need to do our holdings are fragmented so one is consolidation of our holdings two 
as a result of division of the land in the farm families very few families now have enough land based on which they can support the farm family so for our holdings to be economically viable on which we can have mechanization and we can produce crops vegetables or fruit that have assured quality which either we want or we want to export to the other countries we need to have a cooperative and contract farming and this recommendation from all the agricultural scientists uh, in the in india and the agriculture departments the three krishi kanun jo aaye the wo isi recommendation ke base pe aaye the but they were probably drafted and presented in a manner that led to a backlash which is unfortunate in this country we should be going more and more in the direction of cooperative and contract farming of course we must have minimum support price on every product that we buy in the market we have a mrp why not farmers products they should also have a baseline below which that product crop production cannot be sustained and if we cannot sustain that crop production below that price tomorrow we may not have tomatoes or onions in the market because it is uneconomic to produce so the farmers must get assured minimum price and there should be a buy back mechanism that's what also these laws also said so that the farmers do not uh, resort to distress sales uh, of course the mechanization in the farm and of course we must have crop insurance which has been initiated but it is in a pitiable form at the moment if a farmer loses his entire crop to a pest attack flood drought right there should be a full compensation compensation immediate compensation without much of the uh paperwork and of course finally thank you all i thank the yspuhf fraternity and of course uh, oh my ekrisat uh, staff i am course my wife is here today i have to thank her otherwise i'll not get that dinner today so thank you all thank you very much and thank you for giving this opportunity jai hind thank you sir for your enlightening and thought provoking words you have acquainted us a lot about various aspects like protected cultivation value addition genetically modified crops and their emphasis in agriculture it was a phenomenal presentation thank you so much sir moving on may i now call upon professor pankaj sood to deliver a brief address to the gathering over to you sir thank you very much uh, sorry for a little bit a uh, very large learned and eminent entomologist dr h c sharma ji dr dia thakur dean abilasi university and had been my teacher at palampo organizing committee dr rajan other faculty members and students already i think we are at the fag end of the day and dr sharma has already elaborated many things whether they are the biotech stresses a biotech stresses latest technologies natural versus chemical farming so my job is quite simple now and i'll not touch much of the things i'll simply uh carry forward only one aspect in my presentation we had been fighting with the insects since our hunger for food it started 
had been doing many ways, many tactics to fight with these insects. But insects, what a wonderful creature they are. They are fascinating, beautiful, but still very devastating. In the process of evolution, if you look at these insects, they evolved probably some 500 million years back. And we human beings evolved only about 20 to 25 million years back. They have probably the witness to five mass extinctions on this earth. And they still are dominating this universe. That is the beauty of the insects. Still, we think that we can control or eradicate these insects. That is probably a misbelief we are carrying. We have to live, co-evolve with these insects. Arthropods, we know that insects, they belong to arthropoda and it is undoubtedly the uh, most important phyla on this universe, contributing about 64% of the diversity on this universe. Even a single order within insects, coleopterite, it is having about 25% of the living individuals. Number of species, if you look at, you can see this insects, they are not only dominating, but new species, whatever we are coming across, across they are from, from this general. And still if we think that we can eradicate them, probably we are in a misbelief. It has already been predicted that if there is a sixth mass extinction, it will definitely be human beings, not the insects. They will continue to dominate and they will dominate. So we have to learn the base and tactics to live with, live with these insects so that we can live in harmony with the nature, we can live with in harmony with the other uh, creatures, including the insects. Coming to just a brief introduction about the fruit flies, we know that fruit flies, which fall in order diptera in insects, they are again one of the most serious, most devastating pests, especially in Himachal's concern because we are known as a fruit state. We are diversifying into vegetable farming and uh, this conference is in the lap of the reason which is known especially for its vegetable cultivation, whether it is tomato, whether it is coconut, whether it is the other oxygen vegetables. Farmers, probably, they are the most innovative, most advanced farmers in the region who are earning uh, maybe somewhere more than one lakh rupees per bigger net profit out of some of these vegetables, which is probably the highest in the country or almost equivalent to the best of the technologies we are adopting. So these fruit flies, if you look at some of the most dominating fruit flies, which fall under or this uh, genus Bactrocera, which is now redesignated as Geogodacus in uh, recent changes in the uh, synonymy or new discoveries in this uh, uh, group due to prevalence of many cryptic, many sibling species. But the most important fruits which we have, apple, pomegranate, kiwi fruit we are talking about. Though still we, we are reporting that these fruit 
flies are not infesting these fruits, but already some of the species of these fruit flies, they have started infesting even the most uh, commercial or cash crops in our region, which is going to be a serious threat, not only to apple industry, but also to pomegranate industry and other major vegetables in the state. And we are in a real uh, challenge to eradicate these fruit flies. Uh, uh, if you look at the life history, why they are so devastating, many of you might be knowing, though most of you are from the diversify, uh, diversified uh, fields, not only entomology, but I'm talking more of the entomology, so it is, uh, you have to bear with me. But because of their concealed life cycle, most of their, uh, part of their uh, life cycle is uh, inside the fruit, so using harmful insecticides, using uh, some of the most uh, toxic chemicals, it cannot be advocated because it will lead to residual problems, particularly in these commodities which are mostly either eaten as raw or a salad or in other uh, base. So, uh, in general, if you look at the scenario of these fruit flies across the world, you can see this uh, particular reason Indo-Malayalam region or Australian region, it is most dominating as far as number of fruit fly species in this Bactrocera group, they are, they are concerned. But if you look at the other reasons also, almost these fruit flies, they have occupied almost all the reasons on this earth. Uh, some of the uh, important families, uh, if you talk about in uh, under Indian scenario, Already more than 400 families, uh, they have species, they have been reported under Indian conditions. Uh, these are some of the important ones, particularly this Correcta, Dorcellis, and uh, this Joneta under uh, fruit crops, and uh, uh, this Jogodacus Tau, Jogodacus Cocorbiti, and uh, uh, this uh, Jogodacus Cotelares in case of uh, vegetables in our system also. Uh, already I've told you these are some of the important in fruit crops. Uh, mostly they are originated in either in India or Southeast, uh, this uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, this is most de devastating one and it is a major pest of some of the most important fruit crops cultivated in co our country like mango, guava, spota, lychee and so on. Uh, if you look, uh, I've just, I was just telling you, uh, Dr. Sarma was also telling that using the latest uh, biotechnological approaches, not only for the management, but also to understand the insects uh, is in coming days are most important. Like uh, earlier, we were talking about these three species, Bactrocera dorsalis, invadens, and papai philippinesis. Uh, they uh, were uh, categorized as different species. But when we understand, uh, properly study these species, particularly uh, in various reasons, it was found that most of these species, they are the cryptic species, and they belong to a single genera, that is this Bactrocera dorsalis only. Recently, all these four species, they have been, they have been merged into a single, uh, this uh, single group like uh, uh, called Bactrocera dorsalis. Similarly, uh, if you look at this Bactrocera joneta, again, the second most devastating uh, fruit fly species, uh, causing serious damage to fruit crops. Uh, if you look at its uh, distribution, it is mostly distributed in uh, this uh, Southeast Asia and uh, African region. It is well established in uh, South, this African region also. Uh, coming to uh, the other important species, uh, which is mostly uh, adapted to new climate, enabling to it, uh, it spread to new regions very fast. And uh, distribution of this Bactrocera dorsalis, Bactrocera joneta, and Bactrocera correcta in various fruit crops in the country, you can see, see right from uh, GNK to the southmost and easternmost regions, you can find almost all these species 
prevalent and causing serious damage to the fruit crops. That is a serious concern in the coming days. How can we manage these fruit plies? Uh, similarly, similarly, in case of vegetables, we know that uh, this Vectorsera uh, correcta, Vectorsera cucurbiti, and again using these biotechnological approaches, we can find that though this is distributed big grossly in almost all the region in southeastern Asia, but still we can see uh, the haplotypes, mostly they are not distant very, uh, uh, they are very shortly distant and all the major populations, they belong to a single major haplotype, haplotype or single major group. Hence, using the techniques particularly like uh, SIT, IIT, etc., they are very easy when, the sing when a single population is spread across the regions. Uh, this is in case of Bactrosera tau. And here again we can see different populations uh, in our country. They are very similar to this Thailand A, uh, 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 this uh, group, which is mostly prevalent in all across the southeastern Asian regions. Again, from this, uh, these are some of the use of uh, some of the recent techniques which can help us to manage uh, these serious pests in a big way. Uh, this is again a new species reported uh, some five years back uh, from our uh, region only. And uh, here we can see most of these fruit flies earlier we were talking about they can only uh, infest the ripening fruits or the uh, fruits or other parts of the plant. But this particular species is more serious in Himachal, in, uh, in uh, relation to the Himachal because it can lay its eggs not only on the new twigs, new branches, but also on the uh, fruits and other small, uh, this uh, developing fruits. So even a single fruit fly, which can lay up to 200 eggs, that can damage some 200 fruits. So that is again a very serious uh, concern. Uh, this is the distribution of various species of uh, fruit flies in, uh, under Indian scenario. Again, you can see uh, all the three major species, they are distributed all across Indian uh, uh, states. Though their uh, uh, damage potential, it varies in some of the regions, but uh, their prevalence in almost all regions, it is again a serious concern. As I told you that the number of insect species uh, with the advent and the advancement of science, this number is growing every day. And Himachal being the hotspot and is a major region of uh, biodiversity, uh, many new species Mostly, they are, maybe they are present, but recently two new species, this is Bactrosira uh, divendri and Bactrosira uh, pravakri, they have been reported, uh, reported last year only. Uh, though earlier these species were misidentified and misreported, miscoated, but uh, now they have been reported on the wild host, which take their population to the new crops and new uh, regions. Uh, coming to, the, uh, to this symbiotic association, we know that insects, they have been dominating uh, since the evolution started. And this prokaryotic association, particularly in, in insects, it is one of the fascinating science in the coming days. Many uh, biology groups, many scientists, now they have a uh, started working on these prokaryotic associations, symbiotic associations, particularly in insects, so that this as understanding this particular association can be best used not only to manipulate the insect population, but also it has uh, paved the base in curing many other uh, uh, diseases of even the uh, human beings also. Uh, Looking at the symbiotic association in various uh, insects, we can see though it is found in many, uh, almost all the insects, but majority of them, they are the, uh, this proteobacteria, which, const uh, which con uh, constitute about 66% uh, of the bacteria, bacterial microbiome or microbiota in case of insects, followed by this firmicules and uh, agri agrinobacteria and uh, spirochetes. Uh, 
some of the examples how insects they have evolved to harbor these symbiotes within their gut. You can see here in various insect uh, orders, you can see here in Lepidoptera, uh, this, uh, these black dots, they are symbolizing the bacterial colonies in case of uh, insect gut. And you can see if it is Lepidoptera, it is in case of uh, uh, midgut, similarly in case of Drosophila, it's midgut. But in case of Hemiptera, in case of Christian bug, if you look at, uh, you can see it is in last, uh, mid-gut region, crop region, which is full of symbiotic colonies. In case of Hemiptera, it is the hindgut region, which is uh, full of uh, these uh, prokaryotic, uh, prokaryotic symbiotic bacteria. So insects, uh, just to depict, uh, depicting this uh, figure, is, but just to uh, give an idea how insects, they have evolved their system to harbor these symbiotic bacteria, which can in turn supply a number of uh, means, a number of ways for their dominance. Uh, some of the symbiotic associations, particularly in Pentatomidae and Taphrotidae, if you look at they, this association, it can be either obligate, it can be facultative, but in some cases, it has also been found that it is pathogenic also, and it can be transmitted over the generations uh, by transovarial means of uh, inheritance, either by ovipositional smearing, sm uh, smearing or through pre-ovipositional smearing, some of the techniques how they are uh, uh, carry forwarding these uh, symbiotic bacteria to the next generations. They can regurgitate the symbiotes on the host plant to make it more attractive, to attract the other individuals from the same species. Or it can be other way. There are a number of roles which these symbiotic bacteria, they play in the uh, insect system, either in their uh, survival or in their dominance. In, in, uh, in case of adults, oviposition behavior, nitrogen uh, fixation, synthesis of semiochemicals, enhanced enhancing the male fitness in SIT seed technology, uh, help immature stages in growth and development, provide lipids, proteins, vitamins, insecticide resistance, etc. So number of roles are being played and manipulating any of these roles being played by these symbiotic bacteria can ultimately help us to manage that particular insect species. Uh, like in case of uh, uh, some of the examples, if you see, they can provide uh, uh, a number of nutrients right from uh, amino acids to essential, uh, these vitamins and uh, minerals, etc. Uh, this is the, uh, just a uh, sketch where we can see that symbionts, they can help in provision of essential nutrients. Uh, in case of uh, some of the important pests, uh, which are most uh, dominating in our region also, uh, they can hijack the plant pathways also uh, like they can uh, seize the expression of genes uh, related to insect, uh, this host defense like uh, uh, jasmonic acid and uh, salicylic acid and a number of other examples in the literature are there. Uh, here it is the example of hijacking of the uh, plant pathway by the symbiotic bacteria. Uh, similarly, it is uh, in case of uh, aphid where aphid can change its color due to the presence or absence of a symbiot uh, symbiont that is Rickettsia. Uh, whenever a, uh, this predator, uh, it comes in, uh, uh, in association with this particular aphid, it can change its color and it is only due to uh, the presence of this uh, rickettsial symbiotic bacteria. Uh, similarly, in case of uh, uh, this uh, pesticidal degradation, I have told you that they can degrade the harmful uh, toxins into the very uh, uh, less, uh, less toxic chemicals. So how can we manage using this, these ambience? Uh, there are, again, uh, they have been manipulated uh, like uh, using antibiotics. Uh, when you use antibiotics on the host surface and uh, the insect feeds on these antibiotics, they, uh, the insect, it can be made uh, uh, aposymbiotic, means it is lacking those particular symbiotic bacteria in its gut. And once the number of symbiotic bacteria in the gut are reduced, ultimately the insect is not to live properly or there are various deformations in its uh, uh, system leading to the management of this pest. 
Uh, there are a number of commercial products nowadays available which can be used as uh, uh, this antibiotics, particularly against the fruit flies for uh, making them, them aposymbiotic. Uh, these are some of the examples. And so some of the roles, some of the means which we can exploit in the coming time to uh, use these symbiotic bacteria for the management of the insect pests like paratransgenesis. Uh, these days, like CRISPR-Cas, this paratransgenesis is another field where, where we are using these uh, uh, symbiotic bacteria particularly to make the crops and the host paratransgenic. Uh, probiotics and mass rearing technologies like uh, uh, SIT and IIT. Uh, colonization, uh, colonization of the resistance, uh, like Dr. Sharma was telling that BT technology, nowadays uh, uh, even using these transgenic bacteria uh, loaded with some antibiotic resistant genes or some toxic, toxic genes, they can be exploited in the coming era to manage the insect pests, uh, pest control, then uh, uh, attract, attracting uh, using these te uh, technologies like we are using nowadays Tulure, Methyl, Eugenol as parapheromones against the fruit flies, but adding these symbiotic bacteria because they are equally attractive to the fruit flies, so uh, supplementing these uh, parapheromones with these bacteria can add, help us to manage these, these insects. Again, some of the examples where uh, we can use these mono monophagous larvae or other populations, either they are obligate or uh, facultative, Accordingly, we can use these populations. Uh, again, some of the uh, examples from literature. Uh, uh, this is uh, one of the study where Klepsiola oc oxidoka, this is, uh, we have done at uh, Palampur where these bacteria, they have been used uh, uh, for attracting the fruit flies under field conditions also. Uh, you can see these, uh, uh, particularly the Spentoa agglomerans and Klebsiella exotoka, they can be uh, used or exploited for management. Uh, in case of uh, cucumber, some of, uh, this is very important, uh, particularly I'll stress upon this. Uh, these bacteria, they have specific cues, and once you go through uh, characterization through uh, this uh, GCL, uh, GCMS or HPLC, we have found certain uh, chemical like uh, caryophyllin and uh, trichocines, and now it has been reported how these trichocines, uh, this uh, caryophyllins and uh, uh, muscosine, etc., they can be exploited for uh, managing these insects. Recent, this is a very recent publication in the current biology where these uh, bacterial symbionts they have been found to uh, produce certain uh, this lures like trimethylpyrazine and uh, tetramethylpyrazine which is a very good attractant for females. Till now we are using the, uh, this uh, parapheromones only against the male ones, but these two chemicals, they have been reported to be attractive to the females. So coming days probably using these uh, sort of technologies can help us further. Uh, similarly, this colonization of the marker strains of uh, bacteria in the host gut. So these are some of the future uh, means which can be used particularly in the symbiotic uh, technologies. Already this CRISPR-Cas9 technology Dr. Sama has elaborated using transposon uh, and uh, this paratransgenesis using uh, at, uh, this uh, RNAs, higher pin RNA technologies, uh, transgenic targeting specific genes. And some of these uh, technologies, they can be used. So because uh, I think uh, Already the timing for the buses is there, so thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for taking us into the fascinating world of insects through your wonderful presentation. May I now invite Professor Lalita Reddy to address the gathering. Over to you, ma'am.
Good evening, everybody. Um, I think uh, this is a time for you girls to catch the bus, I understand. So I'll just take some five to six minutes of your time, not to give a lecture, but to have a conversation with you about all this. Respected uh, dignitaries on the DAS and uh, the staff, <laughs> yeah, and the uh, students, the student community, which is always very dear to me because I was also a professor in a university. Because if at all something happens in this country, I feel it's only through the student community, but not anybody else. And uh, today's world is that sustainable agriculture. And I'm sure you, ha you know there are many aspects about the sustainable agriculture, but I want to touch upon the organic farming. Because basically, I'm a professor in nutrition and dietetics, so I want to talk about the organic foods. What is organic farming? You all know that. It is a production of food with uh, no synthetic chemicals and, uh, I mean, uh, genetically modified components, yes? But they, this is something, uh, I mean, a very important thing I have to touch. See, I come from Bangalore. Whenever you know that organic foods are very expensive, whenever the people get into the organic store, all they say is, it's very expensive, why should I pay? The rich people say, I can afford to pay, but how am I sure that the foods do not contain any chemicals? That's a question, right? Then how do we market it? Then uh, the rich people can afford to buy the organic foods, but they are also very intelligent in Bangalore. They send the food to the lab to find out the traces of pesticides. And they come back and say, this is all farce, there is no organic food. But here the education goes. Organic food doesn't mean it is the total absence of chemicals. And you all know that it is the pesticide residues of the organic foods are very less compared to the non-organic food. But who are there to educate them? The word uh, organic food has become very fashionable. And everybody says organic foods but nobody knows exactly what exactly is the definition of the organic foods. And um, here the end or the goal or the vision of all these uh, speakers is uh, to have to maintain the uh, ecological balance and in turn protect the ecosystem, if I'm right. And here I'm connecting this ecological balance and the ecosystem to our uh, body because I'm telling you I'm a nutritionist. Uh, how do I connect? I connect all these uh, things to the gut microbiome. That is the microbes which are present in our gut. You all know that. We have bacteria, fungi, virus, everything is in the uh, body and it is totally called microbiome. But there are trillions of these in our body. In fact, the latest studies have said that our genes, I mean three-fourths is the genes of the microbes and only one-fourth of our genes we are proudly telling we have the genes, we have the DNA and all that stuff. So now this takes where? To the disease, right? Everybody says, the doctor says your father has the diabetes so you are bound to get the diabetes. So there the fear starts. But if we are carrying only one-fourth of the genes, how can I blame my father for my uh, diabetes? Then it, we have, we cannot blame it, we can connect it to the gut microbiome, the genes of them which are giving us the disease, right? So just like in the ecological balance, we have to maintain the ecological balance in our system. So you'll be asking me, why are you talking about this gut microbiome to the organic foods because we are the agriculture students? I'm trying to tell you one thing, because organic foods has a connection to have a symbiosis in our gut. Is it clear? So otherwise there is a dysbiosis. What is a dysbiosis? Symbiosis is you have both pathogens and the good microbiota in our system and there should be a balance. Whenever there is increase in the pathogens, your gut microbiome should act on that, see that there is a balance prevails. Dysbiosis is something where there is a disruption in the balance. So how the organic foods will be connected? Organic, I mean non-organic foods which are, uh, you know, grown with uh, pumping the antibiotics and the pesticides, everything, will enter your system and spoil the good bacteria. So what happens is the dysbiosis in the system, right? This dysbiosis is already connected to whatever we call the lifestyle disorders like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, including the cancer. They see there is a disruption in the microbiota in the system. So where do we go? How do we tackle the situation? 
it's not only growing the organic foods, but convincing the people, even if it's a little expensive, go for that, and telling them organic foods is not devoid of any chemicals, you don't have to sue the companies. Right? That's number one. And recently they have also found that gut-brain access. That is, whatever your emotions are, whatever your cognitive functions are in your brain are also related to your gut microbiome. That means, for the student students, if you have to, yeah, I mean, you will be studying so good and if you can't perform in the exam because you are uh, gut microbiome on that day, for that reason, maybe the previous day you had uh, processed foods and you had the diarrhea, why do you say that I, I could not write the exam even though I had an answer? Just because there is access, there is an access, as I say, and the micro, there is a barrier which is broken because, because of the pathogens, because you have pumped so much of pathogens into you and the good bacteria is unable to maintain your microbiota. So, okay, now I just want to tell you one thing. I think I want to stop here. Everybody is going through the stress, right? Stress. The minute I say stress, uh, suppose I ask you how many of you are stressed, I think including me, I may raise my hand like that. Yes, I have stress. We all have stress of some sort of other. But how does it affect? This stress will definitely affect your gut microbiome. So once your stress affects the gut microbiome, the one which is already being, uh, uh, what you say, abolished by taking non-organic foods or the foods, now, I mean highly processed fruits which containing everything, then that will cause havoc in the body. Isn't it? Then not that everybody with the stress will end up with cancer. It's not happening like that. But if you have a stress, if your gut microbiome is not able to tackle or uh, end the stress, then definitely you are in for a different diseases. So this, uh, actually I heard all these um, talks today. I was really impressed, really. And I have to thank everybody for giving me this small opportunity to have a conversation with you because I don't think I am here to give a lecture, but I just wanted to give a conversation. Please take care of your gut microbiome. See, everything follows. Your health, your education, your whatever it is you want to achieve in your life, if your health is not good, I think nothing can be done. Even if your food is available, you should have the knowledge to choose what type of food. Now you can ask me a question. You are telling the food is very expensive, ma'am. How do we tackle it? How can I go back and tell my parents buy only organic food, right? They say, our income is not enough, son, to buy all organic food. It's only for the elite people. Now, I want to tell you, there are some studies where said, we always say that there are dirty dozen, we say. So you can't have organic foods like your wheat, your rice and everything. It's not possible because we cannot afford it simply. So what to do then? How do we go about, please? Uh, there are dirty dozen, we say like uh, fruits, vegetables, your milk and milk products, you be careful. So when you are buying your fruits, when you are buying your vegetables, when you are buying your uh, dairy, see that as far as possible you go for the organic food. The next question is, there are people who ask me, why do I have to go to a, um, organic, for example, cold pressed oil, which is so expensive, right? 500 rupees, who will afford? Then I can tell you, when you buy, I am telling you there are many women and also men who enters the kitchen nowadays. If you buy a liter of oil of 500 rupees, you will be very cautious in using it. Right? So it is a double-edged sword. You are taking less oil and you are also eating good quantity, I mean, uh, what is it, good quality of oil. Isn't it? Everything is in our brains. We cannot say we cannot do it. If we have to survive in the system, we have to find the ways and we have to fight with the, I don't say fight with the system, uh, but um, be intelligent enough to choose your food so that your gut microbiota is good. I think, again, thank you for uh, patient listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your beautiful insights on perspectives of life through all the domains. It's now time for the distribution of awards. I call upon Dr. Dia Thakur and Dr. Rajan and all the dignitaries to do the honors. Best MSc Thesis Award goes to Anuradha. PhD Horticulture in Vegetable Science from CSIR IHBT Palampur. 
A big round of applause, please. Young Scientist Award goes to Meera Devi, Soil Science, Scientist Krishi Vignana Kendra, Kandhagat. Best KVK Scientist Award goes to Dr. Anurag Sharma, Scientist at Kandagat. 